Welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday podcast, brought to you in part by our title sponsor, the Cybersecurity Inside podcast. Visit cybersecurityinside.com slash research Saturday. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down the threats and vulnerabilities, solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. What we saw since the beginning of uh, 2022 was... uh, a lot of new campaigns where uh, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that were being leveraged uh, changed significantly. That's Deepan Desai. He's global CISO and head of security research and operations at Zscaler. The research we're discussing today is titled Return of the Evil Num APT with updated TTPs and new targets. And now, a word from our title sponsor, the Cybersecurity Inside podcast. Cybersecurity continues to be a hot topic. It's relevant for all of us these days, no matter what field you're in. And the Cybersecurity Inside podcast is a fantastic resource to stay up to date on the latest news and trends, whether you're a security expert or just want to know more about cybersecurity. The Cybersecurity Inside podcast is hosted by Tom Garrison and Camille Moorhart, They host industry leaders to help us learn about the world of cybersecurity and make it easy to understand today's most important security and technology topics. Recent episodes have covered the ethics of artificial intelligence and machine consciousness, where we're headed with the cloud, how small businesses get access to cybersecurity resources, and much more. With every episode, you'll walk away smarter about cybersecurity and have fun while you're at it. Check out cybersecurityinside.com slash research Saturday today to listen to the latest episode or search for Cybersecurity Inside wherever you listen to podcasts. And we thank the Cybersecurity Inside podcast for sponsoring our show. And now a word from our sponsor, Keeper Security. Keeper is the top-rated cybersecurity platform for protecting organizations of all sizes from the most common password-related data breaches and cyber attacks. Did you know that 81% of data breaches are caused by weak password security? Keeper is more than a password manager. It's a scalable and customizable security platform that includes industry-leading features such as automated user provisioning, role-based enforcement policies, SSO SAML integration, advanced reporting compliance, breach watch dark web monitoring, and more. Members of the CyberWire community will receive a free three-year personal password manager when they take a business demo. Visit KeeperSecurity.com slash CyberWire to learn more. And we thank Keeper for sponsoring our show. Change in the targets was one of the things. Change in the way the payloads were being delivered was another. And the overall success in terms of uh, staying undetected, like some of the IOCs that were involved, uh, was also interesting in in, in these campaigns. And is is that in general, I mean, point to a a well-resourced, you know, uh, well-funded, well-run organization? That that is uh, yes, usually the case of uh, some of these well-funded, well-run APT groups uh, that we observe. It's just uh, when we see a significant change in uh, in some of the techniques that they've been using. Uh, I mean, it, it it's definitely much more undertaking on their part to go through, and we'll we'll talk about some of those techniques in this call. Well, let's dig into some of the details then. I mean, do, do we want to start off? Is it useful to to uh, have a little bit of history here of of where Evil Num began, the types of things that they were known for before we get into some of the changes? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the key targets for Evil Num APT Group have been primarily financial services uh, organizations. And they were targeting companies dealing with trading and compliance, primarily in the region of uh, UK and, and overall Europe, uh, to be honest. So that's where we were seeing uh, a lot of these activity. What changed, um, um, and this is as of March of 2022, we observed <laughs> the update in terms of the choice of targets. And um, one of the primary one that uh, really draw our attention was them starting to target an intergovernmental organization which deals with uh, international migration services. And and the other interesting part was the timeline of attack. Um, and the nature of the target uh, chosen coincided with the Russia-Ukraine conflict as well. Who do we suppose is behind Evil Numb? Do, do we have a good sense there? That's where uh, the attribution in terms of the, um, the country behind it, uh, I, I would stay away from that for this group. Um, I mean, there are a couple regions, but yeah, this, this one will stay away from that. Well, let's dig into some of the other things that you're observing here. I mean, what, what are they up to these days that uh, caught your eye? Right. So I'll, I'll dive into the campaign that we um, uncovered and then and, and published our analysis. So number one, back in the day, they were using, um, and this is as early as last year, some of the campaigns that the team observed, we noticed them using uh, mostly Windows shortcut files, which is LNK files sent inside a zip archive, uh, which are usually sent with through email attachments or, or getting a user to click on the link to download them. In the most recent one, and I'm talking about the uh, March one, they started uh, leveraging macro documents um, and, and using template injection technique, which is used by many other groups as well. But what was unique over here was they were also making use of uh, something that we call VBA code stomping technique. And I'll, I'll explain it in, in easier terms what that means. But so it's a macro document using template injection, leveraging VBA stomping technique. The outcome of this is it is able to bypass a lot of static analysis tools as well as uh, also deters, uh, you know, reverse engineering uh, from, from some of the security analysts. What the VBA code stomping uh, technique does is it essentially, uh, you know, destroys the original source code and only a compiled version of the VBA macro code is stored inside the document. So it's also known as P code, right? And then mm. that's what uh, causes the uh, static tools at times to not detect this. So it makes it more challenging to reverse engineer. Uh, yes, and that as well. So detecting it using those static uh, analysis tools uh, by various security engines, yeah, that's, that becomes challenging and also to analyze by the researchers using automation as well as even manually. Uh, you, know, you need to have a few extra steps before you figure out what's going on. Hmm. Now, so that's a stage one. It starts with that, then it delivers a heavily obfuscated JavaScript which is uh, further used to download and decrypt um, and the encrypted binary on the endpoint. Right? So that's another way in which uh, they are keeping that final payload uh, shielded from uh, getting detected. And here as well, we saw several new techniques. Um, the way the code is obfuscated, right? I mean, you will see many other groups leveraging obfuscated JavaScripts as well. But uh, there are a few things that we have uh, documented in our in our analysis. Uh, one one of the ones that I would call out is them uh, making use of this shuffling technique. In easier terms, think of um, an obfuscated uh, JavaScript code where there are there's like a array of strings, and those strings are basically getting replaced by the actual code on on uh, one when the code becomes deobfuscated. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of automated tools that are able to do this process of deobfuscation automatically. With this shuffling technique, there is an added layer of obfuscation that happens uh, before you're able to replace those strings or variables uh, with the actual piece of code. So that also breaks a lot of the automation. 
and uh, mm-hmm. makes it difficult for the static tools to detect. So that's the second uh, stage uh, payload where this uh, obfuscated JavaScript is involved. Uh, and that is responsible for, as I said, decrypting the binary payload. And at the binary payload stage, <laughs> uh, they're again using a technique called Heaven's Gate technique. Um, mm. And this is this is not a new technique. It has been used by other groups as well. It's basically a method for running you know, 64-bit code in a, in a 32-bit process. Right? And again, the goal over here is to evade some of the security scanners uh, when they're trying to deliver this uh, malicious payload. Is it a case with the obfuscation, as you're, as you're describing here, is this a, a bit of a, a cat and mouse thing where you'll see innovation from the APT group and then eventually will the tools used to analyze it catch up to that? Absolutely, yes. I mean, these are uh, there are new techniques that we observe being used by them. And uh, um, we always talk about how these APT groups have access to many of the tools that, uh, you know, us uh, as security researchers have access to as well, like things like VirusTotal or, or, or their own version of VirusTotal, for instance, where they will test out uh, security scanners, they will test out even the publicly exposed sandboxes and figure out ways to get around them. And then once those payloads are used in uh, some of these attacks, uh, security folks discover them. Uh, they will try to make sure that the engines are updated uh, to handle that uh, newer technique as well. So it is uh, it is cat and mouse game. Now, the amount of uh, coverage that you're able to achieve with those updates, right? You shouldn't just add coverage for what you just observed, but also take into account future variations, right? They did this, they could do similar things on 10 other areas. That will be the difference between the future campaigns being successful, as successful as the one which we just talked about. Is it fair to say that uh, for folks like yourself who are looking into this sort of thing, that, you know, that's part of the fun is uh, is figuring out, you know, what's going on here and trying to, to see where they're going next? Absolutely. I mean, that's why most security folks uh, will say there's never a dull day. You're always learning <laughs> <laughs> newer stuff, right? There, there, There's a constant evolution happening on both sides of the table. Well, let's talk about persistence. How do they maintain that? Yeah, so in this case, um, uh, and that was another part uh, where they were trying to evade detection, where they were taking, uh, they were making use of um, uh, some of the well-known process names from Windows OS uh, when the binary is getting dropped. So it's basically a spoof legitimate Windows uh, as well as some of the third-party binary names that were being uh, leveraged for dropping the... And to achieve persistence, uh, they will uh, basically create a scheduled task uh, that will ensure that the payload executes um, every time the Windows uh, system starts. Is there an effort to hide that as well, the scheduled task to, to evade detection? I mean, it, that, that's where the, the names that they're choosing, as well as the directory structure, if you notice, they're putting the binary inside Microsoft font-related uh, folders. I see. And, and then the name chosen for the scheduled task is also update model task. So it's fairly generic, leveraging Microsoft font uh, directory structure, so yes, uh, that that basically helps them hide the persistent command. I see. No, it makes total sense. Well, let's move on to the next stage then. I mean, where are they actually dropping on the system? Yeah, so this is where once once the binary is dropped uh, in that fonts folder, that's uh, where it will be executed from. And uh, even on the uh, execution stage, I, I mentioned about Heaven's Gate technique. And that's how... Uh, the actual malicious payload, uh, the backdoor payload that will be responsible for CNC activity, will get decrypted in the memory. This uh, binary will then uh, choose the CNC domain for performing the command and control activity, right? receiving commands, uh, responding back with information that the threat actor is in, interested in. Here as well, wh- when we looked at the domains that were involved, many of them were registered to 
match the target organization, right? So some of them were typo squatted. Uh, some of them were uh, matching uh, well-known services. So some of them were even matching the themes um, that were going on. So if you look at it, uh, there's a domain called covedd.org, right? So COVID-related uh, domain that was azuredcloud.com, another type of squatted domain, right? Azure Cloud is what is being used. Um, there's a misspelled one for Norton Analytics, uh, where the N is missing as part of the analytics. So many of these domains, they, they managed to keep uh, uh, undetected for for months, actually. And then so ultimately, what are they after here? So this is uh, definitely a financially motivated group. They're after your <laughs> dollars, right? They will steal information. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and uh, you know, we've seen in the past uh, them using crypto theme, uh, finance themes. Their main motive is to, to gain dollars. So crypto, finance, and immigration is what we have uh, seen in the past two years being leveraged as themes by this group. And so what are your recommendations then for organizations to best protect themselves? Yeah, so in this case, um, uh, again, I, I always go back to the zero trust uh, fundamental pillars, uh, right? Uh, especially in this day and age where you have this hybrid remote workforce, right? Folks coming into the office, folks still working remote or doing both. Uh, you need to ensure you have uh, consistent security being applied to all your endpoints, um, right? When they're egressing to the internet. So the four pillars that I always call out is prevent compromise. Uh, that's where you ensure consistent security policies are applied no matter where your endpoints are. Prevent lateral movement. The damage is fairly limited when they manage to hit one of your endpoint. But the as soon as that blast radius increases from one endpoint to your entire network, that's when it translates into an organization-wide breach, right? And and in this case, they they will have access to much broader data set. So have controls in place like user to app, app to app, micro segmentation to prevent that lateral movement. Prevent data exfiltration where you're actually inspecting everything that leaves your endpoints. Very important to uh, block this type of exfiltration attempts. And then finally. Uh, you know, you need to reduce your external attack surface. Anything that is exposed to the internet uh, is what uh, many of these threat actors go after, the easy entry points into your environment. Now, one specific engine, um, which I would like to say is a must-have for most enterprises, that's what most security peers, leaders that I talk to believe as well, uh, it's having the ability to perform inline cloud sandboxing, right? As I described, payloads are new, the techniques that they were using brand new. So unless you detonate that payload and observe the behavior, right? And block it at the time the attack is happening, uh, you know, um, that specific engine plays a very important role in achieving that. You know, it also strikes me that this could be a good case for uh, the the use of of threat intelligence. You know, if you have someone on the lookout for things like the typo squatting, as you were saying, you know, registering domains that are similar to things that are of interest to your organization, that could have value as well. Absolutely, yeah. Sh uh, keeping an eye on uh, newly registered domains, um, as you mentioned, typo squatted domain detection. And then ultimately, when you discover these kind of things, uh, sharing is caring and having all the security vendors, all the security community, be making them aware of uh, these new TTPs. So we all as a group come up with uh, newer countermeasures, uh, whether it's uh, adding coverage for the IOCs observed or whether it's uh, adding coverage for the overall techniques uh, that were seen so that uh, even if the IOCs change, uh, we're still able to block these type of attacks. Our thanks to Deepin Desai from Zscaler for joining us 
The research is titled Return of the Evil Num ATP with updated TTPs and new targets. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks to the Cybersecurity Inside podcast for their sponsorship. Visit cybersecurityinside.com slash research Saturday or search Cybersecurity Inside wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible. If your company would like to reach a quarter million unique listeners every month, send us a note at thecyberwire.com slash sponsor. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Rachel Gelfin, Liz Irvin, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. Hold up. 